Our next speaker is Ben Kraft. Ben is a terrestrial biologist with Colorado Parks and Wildlife who began his career in 2011. He is not only an incredibly knowledgeable hunter, but also an exceptional biologist. I'm excited to have him discuss uh, bighorn sheep, or I'm sorry, mountain goat identification and habitat. He's, he's doing mountain goat identification and habitat, excuse me. Uh, please welcome Ben Kraft. Great. Thank you, Jason. So I had the pleasure of working with Jason in Area 2 for about seven years. So he's just transferred to his new position. So a big loss for the area, but he's doing a great job at his current position. So disclaimer, this is a Mountain Goat ID presentation. So this is a visual presentation. So I would encourage folks to move up because we're going to be presenting a lot of stuff on the, on the PowerPoint. So don't everybody rush at once. <laughs> You guys must have bought your optics, that's good. Um, so first I'll just say welcome and congratulations. Um, one of the biggest hurdles in harvesting a mountain goat in the lower 48 is getting a license and you lucky hunters have done that and you're here at the orientation. So if you continue putting in work like that, you guys are likely gonna have a really successful hunt. Um, as Jason mentioned, I'm a biologist here on the front range, and I work with three mountain goat GMUs, G7, G16, and G15. So if you guys have those licenses, try to hit me up next door. Um, and I'd also encourage you to talk to the local district wildlife managers. Those are the guys that live and work in those areas and are wildlife experts. So take advantage of that resource. Um, we have a really excellent staff. Um, let's jump right into it here, I guess. Um, uh oh, technical difficulties. Thanks. So, Mount Goat identification. Why? Why is it important? Why is it useful? Um, I think. Since these licenses are so coveted, demand is so high, we don't draw, throughout our life, we're lucky if we draw two or three mountain goat licenses in Colorado. So learning more about the species, their habits and identification is just another way to extend your hunt, to get the most out of your hunt, to maximize the hunt that you're going to be taking place in. Um, another important factor is if you have any preconceptions of the goat that you're going to harvest, whether that be the sex, the age or some trophy characteristics of that goat, this is going to be something that you're going to find useful. Um, and even if you're not worried about that, if you've got an either sex license and you, you don't care, it's still really cool to be able to look at a mountain group and identify the individuals in the group. Um, another, another important reason for mountain goat identification, um, in Colorado we issue either sex and nanny only licenses. So if you are one of those hunters with a nanny or female only license, it's incumbent upon you to do the right thing to be able to identify your mountain goat. And then from kind of a different perspective, you guys as hunters are conservationists and managers. And you guys are helping Colorado Parks and Wildlife and all the other state agencies manage mountain goat populations. So being able to identify goats properly is a really, really powerful tool for wildlife managers to manage for sustainable mountain goat populations. And this next slide is, is an example of that. This is why you should have moved closer. Um, so this goes through three scenarios here of selective harvests, where a hunter harvests a billy, a nanny, and then a nanny with a kid. Um, and those are the three separate columns up here. Um, and, we'll, and it's an artificial population in that it doesn't consider things like density dependence, predation, and the myriad of other environmental factors that impact big game populations. But even though it's simplistic, it's still a really good visualization and tool at looking how selective harvest impacts mountain goat and big game populations in general. Um, so we start with the population um, in year one, and we start with a population of two billies, one nanny and one nanny with a kid. In the first scenario, the scenario on the left, and this is going to go through four different time steps from year one, the hunter selects a billy. And you can see by year five, so four years later, 
with normal population growth, even though, it, like I said, it's a little artificial, we end up with 14 mountain goats. If a hunter selects a nanny, which is the column in the middle, you can see, starting with five goats again, we end up with 10 goats after four time steps. And then if a hunter selects a nanny with a kid, and this is assuming the kid dies, which isn't necessarily the scenario in Colorado because we harvest our, mountain, our seasons are late enough that that's typically not a factor. But if you start with five, harvest a nanny with a kid, the kid does not survive. Then by year five, so four time steps later, you've got seven goats. So you can see, depending on what sex of mountain goat is harvested, you can almost triple your goat population, almost double your goat population, or if you ha harvest a nanny with a kid, the population is basically stable. Um, so looking at that diagram then, you would say, well, why would you ever want to harvest a female mountain goat? Why wouldn't you just continue to harvest male mountain goats? Um, well, mountain goat populations in Colorado and a lot of other lower 48 states have done so well um, that there are actually concerns with sustainability of the population, overuse of habitat, and other impacts to wildlife species. Um, so these nanny-only licenses are a tool that we can use and implement to manage for sustainable mountain goat populations and their habitat. Um, in addition to that, besides the um, population dynamics and habitat aspects, um, nanny-only licenses are a way to maintain an older age structure of males in the population. So before we ha issued nanny-only licenses and a lot of other states did, we tried to use this with either sex licenses which we primarily started with either sex licenses because mountain goat licenses are so hard to ID and you don't want to get you know, hunters in trouble, so an either sex license. Um, <coughs> excuse me, so with the nanny only licenses, we're able to harvest females that we want to maintain or decrease the population and reduce the harvest pressure on the billies. So we're able to do two things at once, really. We're able to maintain the population that we want and then maintain an older age structure of mature males in the population. Um, so that's why we issue those nanny-only licenses. This, uh, this slide is uh, our, web page, or, uh, our link to our web page. Um, if you go to Carl Parks and Wild Wife web page and just click on the search icon and enter mountain goats in there, it'll take you, this will be one of your search items there. And this, this website, this web page on our website has a lot of really cool information on it. There's a mountain goat ID guide on this website. Um, and there's an, also a mountain goat ID quiz on this website. And several other state agencies also have really, really great information on mountain goat hunting and mountain goat ID. So I'd encourage you guys to look at those. Alaska has a lot of good information. Um, Washington has some good information too, so I'd look at those. Um, and in addition to state agencies, there's a lot of hunting and conservation organizations that put out really cool productions and really cool information um, relating to mountain goat hunting and mountain goat management. And we'll take a minute here to look at one of those productions from the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance, um, in which I normally don't present videos in, in, during presentations, but this is such a high-quality production. Um, I think it's worth us taking a look at this. So we'll get that queued up. This educational video is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance, dedicated to the expansion and enhancement of mountain goat conservation. There is one animal that lives almost exclusively in the steepest, most rugged terrain North America has to offer, the mountain goat. With its thick white coat, specially shaped hooves, and muscular frame, it is uniquely adapted to live in the harshest conditions of the high alpine. There are approximately 100,000 goats distributed over 10 states in the American West and four Canadian provinces and territories. Mountain goat hunting presents a unique challenge, not only because of the steepness of the terrain, but also because it is so difficult to tell the difference between a billy and a nanny while in the field. Mountain goats exist in a matriarchal society where the oldest nannies play a key role in educating younger goats about seasonal habitat use patterns and predator avoidance. Mountain goats have low recruitment rates and typically, nannies do not rear young until the age of four. As a result, the accidental harvesting of breeding age females can have a negative impact on the herd, while selective harvesting of mature billies will ensure the vitality of the population. Being sure to harvest a mature billy 
is a key part of being a true conservationist. Let's take a look at what happens to the future of a mountain goat herd if a hunter harvests a billy rather than harvesting a nanny with a kid. In a micro population of mountain goats, if a billy is harvested, the nannies are left to rear offspring and will continue to birth kids year after year, leaving a population of 14 goats after five years. If a nanny with a kid is harvested, it is very likely that the kid will not survive. The impact compounds over time, only allowing the population to grow to seven goats after five years. When trying to differentiate between a billy and a nanny, there are three main things you're gonna be looking at. Horns, body, and behavior. It is important to use all of these indicators when determining the gender of a goat in the field. We will also discuss field judging and how it can be used to make the identification process easier. One of the most effective ways of identifying a billy is by stalking in close enough to see the size, shape, and configuration of the horns. Gradual horn curvature and the appearance of large, heavy bases and a narrow space between the bases are key identifiers of a billy. An adult billy's horn base will appear wider than the animal's eye. On the other hand, a nanny's horns have a much sharper curve that creates a sort of kink at the tip. She'll also have much narrower bases and less overall mass when compared to a billy. A nanny's horn base will appear narrower than the animal's eye. Another key identifier of a billy is the presence of enlarged black glands, which are used to distribute the animal's scent. Both billies and nannies have glands, though the billies will stand out much clearer. Body size is useful in quickly identifying and sorting through kids, yearlings, and adults. Kids are easily recognizable by their small body size. A mature billy can weigh up to 300 pounds and will have a large hump at the top of the shoulder. They will have a long face, a horse-like muzzle, and appear much stockier than nannies. A mature nanny can still appear large in body size and top the scales at 200 pounds, though more typically they'll weigh in at around 125 pounds. Nannies will typically have a shorter and narrower face than that of a mature billy. One of the largest pitfalls of using only body size to determine gender happens when comparing a mature nanny and a two to three year old billy because both can appear to be about the same size. That's why it's absolutely critical to use more than just one identifier. Mountain goats are herd animals and are often found in groups of varying numbers. Bands larger than three or four are usually family groups composed of adult females, kids, and immature goats of both sexes. Generally, these may be found in more mellow alpine terrain on nursery slopes, where they frequently feed to promote juvenile growth and store fat for the winter. On the other hand, billies usually remain in small bachelor groups or alone, typically in steeper terrain. However, don't rely on this clue in November when billies can be found in the nanny groups as the breeding season approaches. A concrete behavioral characteristic that differentiates billies from nannies is their urination posture. Billies stretch their hind legs backward to urinate, similar to a large draft horse. Nannies squat in a crouched position, much like a female dog. Mature billies often have a stained patch on their hind quarters. This noticeably dark spot is due to more aggressive digging of beds and the messy marking of territories. Nannies do not typically have this stain. According to Boone and Crockett's scoring method, gross total score of a mountain goat is tallied by totaling the two horn lengths measured in inches and four circumference measurements at the base, quarter, halfway, and three-quarter mark of the horns. At close range, it might even be possible to determine the approximate age of the goat. Look for the growth rings called annuli on the horns. The goat's first and highest growth ring is formed during the animal's second winter. This example here, 
this billy would be aged at 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, .5, and 5.5 years of age. A horn that appears to be twice the length of the ear is about eight inches, as most billy's ears will be about four inches long. Visualize the horn straightened out and compare it to the length between the tip of the nostril and the corner of the eye. If a horn measures approximately that distance, you're looking at an eight to nine inch horn. Now let's take a look at a few examples and test your knowledge. Let's start off with an easy one. In this situation, look for the narrow space between the bases of the horns. Notice the long horse-like face in the really stocky body makeup. Also, if you compare the length of the horn to the length of the face, this appears to be an exceptional billy. Let's take a close look at this goat. It appears to have narrow bases and a large space between them. It also appears to have a short face. Considering those things, we can identify this goat as a nanny. Here's one that's a little more tricky. This goat appears to have gradually curved horns like a billy, but they do not have a lot of mass. Also, the goat's face is quite short. Don't let this one trip you up. It's a nanny. Watch as this goat approaches. You can see it has a long face. Notice the gradual curvature and mass at the base of the horns. This is a great example of bases larger than the size of the eye. We would identify this one as a billy. Now here's a tough one. Look at all the things we've learned about body, horn curvature, and social behavior. We're comfortable saying that we do not have enough information to make the call on this goat. In this, and with all cases where there is doubt, don't take the shot. The recent development of flat shooting, long range rifles, and laser range finders have left the goat hunter with a moral dilemma. Though rifles in this day and age are capable of shooting very long distances, it's important to try and stalk in as close as you can on a mountain goat to ensure the proper sex identification. Because goats live in such steep and treacherous terrain, make sure that the animal is not gonna fall into an unreachable spot after you pull the trigger. You do not want your meat and your trophy to go to waste. This educational video was brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance. The RMGA is committed to its mission to increase and enhance the management, range, and populations of Rocky Mountain goats across both native and suitable non-native North American habitats. If you learned something from this video and want to further test your skills, as well as become a member, we urge you to join our cause at GoatAlliance.org. So a really good production. Um, how many of you guys have seen that? I think this is only a year old, but it looks like a handful of people have seen it. So this is available on their website, Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance, and it's also available on YouTube too. So this is something that you guys can continually reference um, in addition to those other resources I mentioned. So, so you guys got it then? Can I leave now? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so goat, goat ID is difficult, and it's so difficult, in fact, that when I fly goats for our surveys, we only classify them as adults, yearlings, and kids. Just, just because when you're in a helicopter and flying at that level, we can't even identify sex most of the time. We can, if you, like if you run on a big group of billies, you pretty much got an idea. But most states actually classify their goats as adults, yearlings, and kids, unless they're doing some sort of ground counts, which we do those also. Um, so for mount goat identification, there's really three primary categories of tools that are gonna help you. The first is being in goat shape, which we keep talking about. So that's you guys putting in your work, getting ready to get up the mountain to do that. Um, the second vital tool, I think, is optics. So the best set of binoculars, the best spotting scope that you can afford, or borrow, if, like, if you know a friend that has a good set of binoculars um, and a spotting scope, borrow, borrow those from them, because it'll, it'll save you a lot of legwork. Um, and then a tripod is also another crucial piece of equipment, in my opinion. Over the last several years, I've really started using binoculars with a tripod, and that really reduces fatigue when you're spending a lot of time looking behind glass. And it also gives you a steadier base, and I think that helps you pick up a lot of movement. So, 
being in shape, having optics, getting as close as you can without disturbing the behavior of the goats so you're not pushing them off, and then being patient, spending some time to actually look at those groups is vital. Because um, goats can blend in better than you think. So mountain goats, big white animals, they live on the alpine tundra, you know, pretty barren landscape. You think, ah, I got it, right? Well, depending on light conditions and contrast at certain times, goats can hide fairly well, um, more so than you would think. Um, so here's an example of a slide. This goat here is out in the middle of a slope, a couple of scree fields, and typically what tends to happen is you misidentify a goat for a rock or vice versa, a rock for a goat. So like I said, depending on when, how certain light conditions are and how the contrast picks up, these guys can be hard to identify, especially if they're alone. Um, here's another slide of some goats and this isn't snow, this is just lighter colored soils. So a good backdrop for these goats to hide behind. And then uh, one of the more difficult conditions, I think, to, to identify goats is in mottled snow or broken snow conditions. So I think if you've got no snow, that's, that's an advantage. That's definitely a help. Um, and then if you have 100% snow cover, that's not so bad either, because you can actually use tracks in the snow to get you two groups of goats across the landscape. But, Modeled snow is, is definitely more difficult. <clears throat> so these next couple slides, I thought we could just go through some slides where we've identified Billy Nanny, and it'll give you guys a, a better look at some of these. Um, and I'll try to leave these on, on the page as long as we can. But like the video mentioned from the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance, rather than using one tool or one characteristics, you want to use that toolbox and use a combination of those to identify goats. And I'll start with kind of the more concrete identifiers and we'll work our way down. And the first being urination posture. So as the video mentioned, when billies urinate, they do the stretch. So the yellow stream comes out right here in front of the hind quarters. Nannies, on the other hand, squat. So either you don't see the yellow stream or it's coming out right back here. So here's a billy on the left. This is the stretch. And here's a nanny squatting on the right. Um, external, gen external genitalia is another pretty good clue. Um, I will say that the later you go into the season, the harder it is to use this as a tool just because the goats get more hair. Um, we've got the picture of a billy. This is a billy on the right, so scrotum is a pretty good giveaway that it is a male. Um, if you don't see a scrotum, I would still use those other characteristics that um, we're going to talk about here, but a scrotum is a, is a dead giveaway of a billy. And then on the left, we've got a nanny. So you've got the anus and then the vulva there. Um, body size and body shape, like the video mentioned. So nannies in general are smaller than billies. Bigger, billies have a bigger body size, and they're also stockier. I mean, like a mature billy just looks muscular. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, I should mention, too, here's, here's, this is the nanny that we're referencing here on the left, and this is the billy on the right. Um, Billies also have to, tend to have what's called the rumba nose, and you see this in other big game species too in the males. So the nose is more of a convex shape where the rostrum is from the eye to the nostril. It's more of one of these than a flat line. So there's the Roman nose. Um, billies also have a more prominent shoulder hump. Um, and then because they're usually on a better nutritional plane than nannies are, um, their coats are more developed. So they develop what's called chaps or pantaloons, and that's simply just the hairline at the lower leg. It'll be more developed in a billy than it will in a nanny. Horns is another great identifier. Um, like the video mentioned, billies will have larger bases, so a smaller gap. So this is a billy on the left. Nanny, smaller bases, and then wider gap. Um, and the thickness will also carry through farther on the base in the billies than it will on the nannies. Um, in billies, billies also have a uniform gradual curve, so the curve on their horn starts lower than nannies, whereas typically in nannies, the curve doesn't start until about a third of the way up the horn, and then the hooks tip, or the, the hooks, uh, hooks near the tip. So when you, when you can look at a goat profile, that's a pretty good way to identify nanny versus billy horns. Uh, the video also mentioned the larger glands behind the horns in the billies, those are more developed and more prominent. Um, and then the, the final identifier with horns is 
the base of the horns is wider than the eye in a billy. And in a nanny, it'll typically be as wide as the eye or, nar or narrower than the eye. <clears throat> so this is a good slide. I don't, this is a slide of just some stock footage that we had. Um, I don't know whose goes these are, but this is a good slide of a few different age classes and sexes of, of mountain goats. So on the far left, we've got a younger billy here, but you can still see it has a fairly wide base and its horns. Um, and another kind of characteristic that wasn't listed in the slide, I think with younger animals, they, is, when they're looking at you, they tend to have more of a triangular shaped face. So the difference between the width of this and this is greater, so it'll be smaller down here. So more of a triangular shape, whereas this is still a triangular shape, but their, his, mouths, his mouth and his nose is more developed, so not as much of a defined triangle. The goat in the middle is a nanny, so you can see narrower bases, wider gap, and then even when you look head on, you can kind of see there's a difference in the curve. It's not a uniform gradual curve for that nanny versus the billy. And then of course on the right, we have a mature billy. It's got the well-developed glands, more prominent glands in the back, really heavy bases, and the face is, looks a lot different than this younger billy here on the left. This is a profile of a couple of these goats. So, like I said, like I said a little bit earlier, the uniform gradual curve is a good identifier of a billy. Has a longer face, um, a longer rostrum than the nanny, whereas the nanny here shorter face, and then it really starts to hook in that last third of the horn tip. Um, group size and group composition are also another good clue into the sex of the goats that you're looking at. So typically. Males occur in a smaller group or in singles. So generally, if you see a goat on its own, it, in all probability, you have a high likelihood that it's probably going to be a billy if it's alone. Um, females tend to occur in larger groups, um, and there's a mix of different ages, so a mix of different body sizes in those groups, because you'll have kids and yearlings in those groups with nannies. And I say usually here because it depends on um, the density of goats in the herd that you're hunting. So some of our goat herds are managed for lower population densities. G15 just west on I-70 is one of those examples where there just aren't large groups of goats. So if you see a pair of goats, um, don't just assume it's two billies. You better use these other markers and other identifiers to, to, assume, uh, to identify it. Um, so age, getting to age, age uh, looking at the facial characteristics is a real good key to aging goats. Um, and this is for nannies and for billies. So young, so these are two yearling, yearlings right here. So young have much shorter faces, much less developed horns right here. Whereas when they get a little bit older, this is a billy here on the right. You can see this is probably a two to three year old billy right here. His face gets a, little, a lot longer, and then his horns get a lot longer also. And you can see that real gradual curve. And this is a two to three year old billy right here too. So you can see face definitely gets more developed. And by the time you get to a, a goat that's over four, they develop what a lot of people refer to as a horse type face. So a lot longer, um, just looks like an older individual. I don't know how else to say it, but just a larger, more developed face. Uh, nanny is the same thing, looking at facial characteristics. Um, younger nannies tend to have shorter faces, um, whereas adult nannies tend to have the longer rostrums. So, um, so these next couple slides are just slides, like I'll try to leave them up here, like I said, as long as I can, so you can get a kind of a good feel. Like it says what it is up there, you can see what it is, and try to use some of those characteristics that we talked about uh, and, and lock those in there. But, I mean, this, obviously, you look at the bases on this goat, a real narrow gap. Um, this is a later season, a really, really good hair. This is probably, this is a summer goat, not probably, this is a summer goat right here. But you can see, again, the really well-developed bases and the long face on that individual. Here's a billy from the profile. Um, so the gradual uniform curve throughout, whereas the nanny's more straight up and then hooks near the tips. Another billy kind of quartering away from us, um, but you can really see that. You can really see how much it curves up here. And then the face is a pretty good giveaway, pretty dead giveaway on the age of that. That's a mature billy right there. <clears throat> Here's another goat just quartering from the other side. 
Are you guys trying to are you guys starting to see that gradual sweep in the, or the you know that uniform sweep in the horns in the billies compared to the nannies? Good. And then here's a billy at profile. This is a late season billy, or but kind of coring towards you, but looking straight on. And this is a good example of real um, evident glands behind the bases here, um, and that's a pretty big bases on that billy also. So. Nannies, this will be just be a couple of slides of nannies so you guys can get a better feel for nannies. So obviously when you've got young of year in the group, you want to start thinking nanny because um, Billy's typically aren't going to hang out with these guys unless it's during the rut. Um, so you can see ma mature nanny, really long face, really well. This is actually a nice nanny. She's got really heavy bases, so her bases are about as wide as her eye. Um, and then. We'll talk about this a little later, but um, nannies tend to have shaggier coats than the billies do, um, and that's just because of the energetic costs of having to give birth um, and then lactating with those young of the year. And hopefully everybody gets this one right. There's a kid on his back. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this is a good profile. The reason why I left this one in here is a really good profile that shows straight and then hooks near the tip. So. Um, this is another really good nanny. I mean, this nanny has good bases right here. Her, her bases are as wide as her eye. And this is kind of getting to be later season, so third or fourth season hunters. You can see she's blown out most of her hair from the prior year, and she's just got one patch here. Um, but that's a really good looking nanny. Here's a younger nanny looking head on. Um, and when they're head on, look at the width of the base and then the distance of that gap, and that's a pretty big gap in between those horns right there. And then a younger looking face on this nanny too. There's another good looking nanny, mature nanny. And she has pretty prominent glands in the back of her, um, at the base of her horns too. So again, like combining all those characteristics instead of just using one characteristic. There's a close picture. This must be on Mount Evans. <laughs> I can see some Cheeto stains right here. <laughs> um, and then this is, this is a nanny on the left and a billy on the right. So horn difference. See that uniform gradual curve right here. And a little bit of the perspective is kind of hard to see, but I would say that's Body size a little bit bigger individual than that nanny as far as body size. Um, so as I kind of alluded to, there's going to be a difference um, on summer coats. So when you guys are out spending time scouting, there's going to be a difference in the way the, the coats look on the goats early season or during the summer and then later in the winter. So what do you guys think this goat is on the left? Billy. That's a Billy. What about this goat on the right? Nanny, very good. See, you guys are getting it. <laughs> um, so get it, getting into coats and characteristics of nannies versus Billy in the first season, the goat on the left is a nanny, and I think this picture was in there already. The goat on the right is a Billy. So see that more developed coat? It's blown out all of its coat from the prior year. So it's, this is all new hair's growth, whereas the nanny has a pretty good patch of, of last year's hair on her. Um, and first and second season, that's a pretty good identifier. In the summer when you guys are scouting, this is a really definite identifier. If you see a shaggy goat, it's 90% chance that it's gonna be a nanny. So, but this is a good shot too, because you see gradual sweep of the horns, thinner bases, um, but both fairly mature individuals, really long face with the Roman nose, and then a longer face on this nanny as well. <coughs> so, um, Kind of talking about hair, during all of our seasons, our goats, the, your goats will probably have good coats. Um, I wouldn't worry about that, whether it's a first or a fourth season tag. Um, but this is typically what the coats are going to look like during first season on billies. So again, as I mentioned, there's, there's not going to be any of last year's residual coat left on them. Um, they'll have blown most of that out. Um, so pretty good coats. First and second season nanny, as I mentioned, you'll have these shaggy patches on these goats, which are pretty good identifiers for nannies. Um, by the time we get around to third or fourth season, those nannies will start blowing that out so that they'll be, there won't be as much of last year's hair on them. So 
there's a little patch on here. And then, of course, another good identifier is kids. Um, I couldn't find any pictures without kids of nannies, so I apologize for that, but that would make it a little bit better. Um, and then here is a, another mature nanny, um, and she just got a little bit of patch left on her hind quarter right there. And this is that same nanny, I think, from a different view. And this has got to be Mount Evans looking at that road. So, <laughs> so if you live close to the Denver area and you're GMU, I keep mentioning Mount Evans, but that's a great place to go look at goats because they're highly visible. They don't really care if you're there. Um, and if you want to practice your skills, um, it's, a, it's a good area to go. And it's only you know, 40, 50 minutes from downtown Denver. Um, third and fourth season billies, they're really going to start developing their coats. So they've been growing their hair for a long time, all summer. Um, so really well-developed pantaloons. Their beards will have really nice beards. Uh, this is an older Billy here on the left, a younger Billy. But you can see they've both got really good hair. Um, and their hair almost gets stringy, you know. It's, this is a, these are winter goats right here. Um, what, what does happen sometimes is it gets harder to identify a mature billy versus younger billies later in the season just because their coats have grown so much. Um, it's, it, they kind of look a little bit comparable, but if you, if you can use body size when they're next to each other, that's a good indicator. Um, and then also, of course, horn length um, on those guys and looking at faces. Um, here's a couple slides of some third and fourth season more mature billies, and you can just see their coats. I mean, this gets to be what I think of as like billy goats and fairy tales, you know? Like, this, this is what those goats start looking like. Um, horn length on a billy, um, and judging horn length on a billy can be difficult because you're talking about inches here. So one of the key identifiers is width of the base. So if they've got really good bases, there's a good chance that they're gonna have really long horns. Um, and like the video mentioned, if you imagine laying this horn out at the tip of the nose and imagining how far it's going to go up the rostrum or up the nose, um, if it exceeds the distance from the nostril to the eye, it's generally going to be over an eight inch goat. So um, a pretty good identifier. And then the other good identifier on horn length, uh, like the video mentioned, is ear size. So from here to here in general is four inches. So. Um, and you can see, I, I left this one in here because this shows a pretty good perspective on how much length you gain in the horn after the curve. So looking at from this perspective, compared to this perspective, you can really see how much length you're picking up here. Um, and then another factor, I guess, to consider if you're you know, potentially going for a trophy animal or Boone and Crockett Pope and Young animal, is looking at the tips too, because like I said, it's a matter of inches here. So if you have some broken tips or if you shoot a goat maybe in an area you shouldn't and it falls a little bit, you're gonna be losing some stuff up here. Um, so, so that's where optics help, being able to identify um, con horn configurations and what they do and don't have. Uh, this is a slide, I don't know where this goat's from, but this is a, obviously a harvested goat, but exceptional bases and exceptional length. And, and when you get into this class of Billy, the, the thing that really stands out to me is the mass carries all the way through the horn. So um, pretty obvious once you start spending time and looking at goats, when you see an individual like this, you know immediately that that's a really, really large goat. Um, so that's pretty much it on the goat ID stuff. I have a little bit of stuff on habitat. Um, but I'm about out of time. Do you guys have any questions in general about goat identification? Yeah. Does it fit, does that gland at their horns, does that change as the season goes on? Does it get bigger? Yeah, so that's a good question. So it depends on the goat, but in general, those glands tend to get bigger the closer those goats get towards the rut. So into November, into December, that gland tends to get more prominent. But there are some individuals that carry those glands throughout the year. So. So generally, yes. <laughs> in those nanny kit groups, do the uh, kits pretty much stay close to their particular nanny? Okay, yeah. So sorry, I forgot to repeat that last question. So this next question was, um, in the nanny kit groups, do those kids tend to stay close to the nannies? And yes, definitely early in the season, those, those kids are right with the nannies. 
Um, and they will be definitely in the immediate vicinity of the nannies during season when you guys are hunting them. So they don't get, they don't get too far apart from each other. So, so one more question. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know that off the top of my head. Do you guys? I mean, an inch and a half? Yeah, inch and a quarter, inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Okay. So, yeah. That's from Alan Vitt. He's a professional. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, so, are you, are you trying to get then at the circumference of the horse? Yeah, Is that what you? Yeah, and I'm not that good at classifying goats to, I mean, because you are, you're talking such small measurements by then that it's, it's, it's really difficult. Whereas I think a lot of people use a combination of different things. I mean, if you talk to a guide or an outfitter, they might be able to let you guys know, but I don't know off the top of my head what the width of a mature Billy's eye is. So, sorry about that. So I'll just wrap up with a few things on goat habitat. I've only got a couple of different, I've only got a few slides here for you guys. Um, but goats tend to hang out in glaciated alpine, or subalpine, and then alpine tundra. So pretty void of trees. Um, they like talus, and this is basically just rocky slopes. So you'll find big rocky slopes on their own. And then at the base of the cliff, you'll find a, a, a talus too. They like cliffs. Um, they use alpine meadows for foraging and loafing sometimes. Um, ridge tops, anywhere they can get advantage and, and see the areas around them. Um, and then just a variety of different subalpine ecotones. And this is just like a fancy slide for saying that goats generally occur at tree line higher and, and, and areas up higher than that. And what's really interesting is one of my colleagues, Lance Carpenter, he was in the room, he just left, but he just wrapped up a mountain goat study where he was looking at habitat use and predicting habitat use of goats based off of GPS collars. And what they found is that elevation is the best predictor of habitat use in goats. So the higher the elevation is, the highest spots on the mountain, you're more likely to find goats in those areas. So, and I think that, that holds true for a lot of the goat areas that I, use, that I manage. Um, I don't know about the rest of the state, but I think in general you can say that. So, so be ready to go to the top of the mountain, <laughs> in short. Um, Google says from tip to tip the eye is approximately one and a quarter inches long. All right, so did you guys hear, hear that? Google, the expert. So if Google says it, it's right. <laughs> from tip to tip is 1.25 inches. So or one and a quarter. One and a quarter, yeah. Um, so goats are amazing on cliffs. I mean, if you ever spend any time watching goats, like, they are so agile, it will blow your mind what they can do. Um, they really don't fear anything. And so this is a group of three goats. It's kind of bleached out. I'm sorry for you guys in the back. It's kind of hard to see, but there's three goats here. They're all similar body size, so I'd assume this is a group of billies and where they're hanging out. I might assume this is Billy's, but they will go to areas where you should not go. So don't go there. And don't shoot them there either, because there's not gonna be anything left by the time that goes, gets down to the bottom of the mountain. Um, so getting back to having some of that patience, like if you have a couple days to spend to pattern those goats and how they're doing that, you can catch, even goats that use areas like this, you'll be able to catch them areas that you can retrieve them successfully and stock them safely. Um, this is slide here just shows a mixed group. So there's a kid here and a nanny. And it looks like a yearling over here. So even these mixed age and mixed sex groups will also use pretty rough terrain too. So just because they're in a rough area doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna be billies. Um, and then here's another good example of that, of a nanny and a kid going up on a cliff where like, even if you put a rope on me, I probably wouldn't go there, you know? So pretty, pretty amazing animals, so. That's kind of all I've got for you guys, unless you guys have any other questions. I think I'm pretty close on time, aren't I, Jason? Five minutes or so, so. 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. So any other questions? All right, well, congrats on your tags, and good luck this season, and uh, 
we want all of you guys to be successful, so get a hold of us and we'll do everything we can to help you guys. Um, but congratulations.